Good day. As diplomatic efforts continue to achieve stability in Afghanistan, a topic I'm going to return to shortly, the situation on the ground in Kabul airport continues to be completely chaotic. I've just been reading an extraordinary um, article in the Daily Telegraph, Britain's Daily Telegraph, which talks about the bitter exchanges between the United States and the Dutch over the, over the conduct of the evacuation of people from Kabul airport. I will quote it exactly so that people can be aware of the sort of things that are taking place there. It, it reads as follows. Questions are mounting over the chaos around Kabul airport after US troops turned away Dutch embassy workers and translators despite them being cleared for evacuation and have an aircraft, having an aircraft waiting for them on the tarmac. It's awful. Many were there at the gates of the airport with their families, Sigrid Karg, the Dutch foreign minister, told the Dutch news agency ANP. The Netherlands aimed to get up to 1,000 local embassy workers, translators and their families out of the country. Karg said... U.S. armed forces securing the airport did not allow any Afghans to enter the gates, even if they had the right credentials. The military aircraft, which was operated by the Dutch together with nor other northern European countries and was only on the runway for an, about half an hour, left Kabul without any people destined for the Netherlands. The Telegraph understands U.S. troops are under strict orders to refuse entry to the airfield until the chaos outside the gates, where thousands of desperate people have gathered, recedes. The U.S. Embassy released a statement to Americans who want to leave that they should get to the airport, but added that the American government, the American government cannot guarantee your security on the way there a vivid illustration of the confusion on the ground. The situation has also left vulnerable Afghans desperate for evacuation, stranded in safe houses in the city. Well, that gives us an idea of how chaotic the situation at Kabul airport is and how the United States military are struggling to take control of the situation. In the absence, by the way, of any senior officials from Washington sent there to take charge and to give direct instructions to the people, the American people on the ground. I would add that this is richly ironic for the Dutch, given that they have been the most unswerving ally of the United States within, within the West European countries that make up the European Union and they must be feeling exceptionally bitter at the way that they are being treated and the way in which their perennial loyalty has been rewarded. Anyway, I leave that issue for the Dutch themselves to sort out between themselves. Meanwhile, it is becoming clear to me that I had underestimated in my previous programme the bitter reaction um, and backlash against the comments made by the United States President Joe Biden the other day when he addressed the American people um, in that room in the White House and spoke to them about the reasons for the US withdrawal and the chaotic scenes that have been unfolding in Kabul airport and in Afghanistan. As I have previously discussed and spoken about, in a pre my previous video on this channel and on a programme I did with my colleague and friend Alex Christoforu on the Duran. The speech came across to me as an, as an, a, 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 an example of a politician trying to divert blame for the events in Afghanistan onto other people. Donald Trump, the Afghan, pres the Afghan president, the Afghan military uh, and refusing to take any blame or responsibility for himself. And that did seem to me 
an unedifying picture at a time like this. But what's become very clear to me is that there was another part of the president's comments which has provoked even more anger and distress, especially in Europe and especially amongst a very powerful constituency, uh, I suspect, within the United States itself, which is some of the people who work within the NGO communities, the regime change community, the neoliberal uh, interventionists and humanitarian interventionists and many people who work in the State Department and in the intelligence community and possibly even the Pentagon who have come to share these beliefs. These are specifically, it seems to me, the words that the President ma made which have created the greatest bitterness and anger. And I will read them and they are taken directly from the transcript that appears on the White House website. We went to Afghanistan almost 20 years ago with clear goals. Get those who attacked us on September 11, 2001 and make sure Al-Qaeda could not use Afghanistan as a base from which to attack us again. We did that. We severely degraded Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We never gave up the hunt for Osama bin Laden, and we got him. That was a decade ago. Our mission in Afghanistan was never supposed to have been nation-building. It was never supposed to be creating a unified, centralised democracy. Our only vital national interests in Afghanistan remain today what it has always been, preventing a terrorist attack on the American homeland. I've argued for many years that our mission should be narrowly focused on counter-terrorism, not counter-insurgency or nation-building. That's why I opposed the surge when it was proposed in 2009, when I was vice president. And that's why, as president, I am adamant that we focus on the threats we face today in 2021, not yesterday's threats. And then he goes through a list of places where the terrorist threat has, in his words, metastasized. And he talks about al-Shab in Somalia, al-Qaeda in the Arab Arabian Peninsula, al-Nusra in Syria, and uh, ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Uh, with its multiple affiliates in multiple countries in Africa and Asia. I will say briefly, as an aside, and it's very interesting that he's spoken about al-Nusra in Syria. I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, what has absolutely shocked and horrified many people, especially in Europe, perhaps especially in Britain, is the repudiation of re democracy promotion which is contained in those words. Because as far as many people around the world, or at least in Europe, and I suspect in the United States also, are concerned, it is democracy promotion, which is the cause that they back and which attaches them like glue to the United States. Briefly, under the, after the end of the Cold War, a belief began to take hold that we were at the end of history, that the liberal system, as it was then defined, had reached its optimal point of development, and that the task of the West, led by the United States, was to extend the system around the world. The person who articulated these ideas most forcefully, at least the political leader who did, was Tony Blair in Britain, as I very well remember. But Blair's words have become the political orthodoxy in Britain and in many other countries, like France especially, to some extent in, Bre in Germany, but also within parts of the United States. For these people to hear the President of the United States saying that the United States is not in the business of democracy promotion, 
that it is going to look after its own interests and not pursue democracy promotion around the world is an extraordinary betrayal. It is akin to the Pope coming and speaking heresies from the throne of St. Peter. Of course, Joe Biden's predecessor, Donald Trump, never believed in these democracy promotion ideas at all and never made any secret of that fact. But the people who believed in these ideas around the world, in Europe and in the United States, were always able to explain that away by saying that Donald Trump was not a legitimate president, that he'd gained power by somehow illicit demagogic means, helped along by the Russians, all that nonsense. And they never assumed that the person who replaced him, Joe Biden, who they took for an orthodox, conventional leader of the United States, would utter words like that. And so they are profoundly shocked by hearing these heresies from his mouth and uh, hearing words from him which suggest that the United States is no longer the exceptional power promoting the neoliberal globalist project around the world, but an ordinary country focused from now on purely on its own national interests. I overlooked the extraordinary effect of these statements upon the regime change community, if you like, precisely because I, of course, have always been opposed to re regime change. I, did, I have never believed in the end of history rhetoric. I have always believed that the United States should, like every other country, base its foreign policy on its national interests. So when I heard Joe Biden say these things, I didn't take his comments, perhaps with a sense of importance that I should have done. But others who have fallen for all, these, all this rhetoric and all of these ideas, or who have pretended to do so, and we should never, of course, underestimate the extreme cynicism with which much of this enterprise has in practice been conducted. Anyway, for them, hearing Joe Biden, the President of the United States, talk in this way has come as a shock. And I'm going to touch on one article in The Guardian, which is absolutely a paid-up member of this enterprise, and I will quote some of the words that have appeared there. And uh, it, they, to me, um, illustrate some of the comments that we are hearing from these people who believe in re regime change and who feel, at this moment in time, deeply betrayed. So we learn, for example, that Biden and its uh, uh, claim that the US and its allies gave Afghans every chance to determine their own future but ultimately could not provide them with the will to fight for their future, is drawing serious criticism from senior Conservative MPs, Labour, uh, Labour, the Labour Party, and from the Liberal Democrats. The Labour Party, of course, since Jeremy Corbyn left, is now completely committed again to democracy promotion and regime change around the world. We learn from The Guardian that pressure is mounting on Boris Johnson to disavow Biden's comments, that Keir Starmer has said that he's deeply concerned by Biden's address and that he did not and that Biden did not recognize the wider consequences of the actions that he's taken. We read that the Liberal Democrat leader, Ed Davey, is now saying that Biden had been left frozen by events and uh, and I was negligent and unprepared and we learn we learned that a conservative uh, Gavin Barwell former chief of staff to Theresa May says that it is time to wake up and smell the coffee the democrats and republicans no longer believe the united states 
should be the world's policeman. The lesson for Europeans is clear. Whoever is president, the United States is unlikely to offer the same support that it used to in parts of the world where its vital interests are not involved. Europeans are going to have to develop the in capability to intervene without US support. That's not going to be cheap. And the EU and Britain are going to have to work out how to cooperate on this because we face the same threats. And Tom Tugendhat, another Conservative who's the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, said that he was extremely angry at Biden's comment, criticism of Afghan soldiers who have been incredibly brave. Well, I don't know where he got that idea from, but anyway, that's what he said. And that the United States withdrew from Afghanistan like a thief in the night. And another Conservative, Hugh Merriman, who is a former Treasury Minister, called Biden a total blithering idiot. And that he says that he makes me wonder if he is the Siamese twin of Donald Trump. Another Conservative, another former minister, says it is the end of the American era. The more you reflect, the more you realise the speech Biden gave last night was grotesque. An utter, an utter repudiation of the America so many of us have admired so deeply all our lives. The champion of liberty and democracy and the guardian of what's right in the world. Well, I'm going to say straight away, I find all of these criticisms utterly crazy. I totally disagree with them. I think that the United States as a country, has been led up the garden path by those who wanted to embark upon some kind of utopian project to spread democracy round the world. But that is, as I have said, the orthodoxy. Many people have accepted, at least people in power, and for them, seeing the President of the United States repudiated in this way, especially when that president is Joe Biden, has come as a profound shock. You might even call it a, a moment akin to the one in 1956 when Nikita Khrushchev repudiated Stalin and his legacy at the 20th Party Congress, creating a shock from which the communist world never fully recovered. Well, will it be on that scale? Probably not, but we should not underestimate the gravity of what has happened. And if I have focused on Britain, it is because I live here. I understand that similar things are being said in France by the very strong humanitarian interventionist lobby there. And in Germany, where it also exists, though to a lesser degree. And of course, there are people in the United States who think like that also. So for all of them, Biden's comments, his uh, speech, has gone down like a shock, and many of them feel, as of this moment in time, a deep sense of betrayal, and for the first time, probably, they are now seriously worrying about the future of their cause, the liberal, neoliberal, globalist cause, to spread what they call democracy um, around the world. Anyway, I'm not going to say more about it than that. All of what, all that I have quoted comes from The Guardian. As I said, the main <laughs> spokesman here in the media of these sorts of ideas, but it is not exclusive from The Guardian. And all of those comments give one a sense of how broad within the political class the sense of betrayal and shock at this moment is. Anyway, as the Americans and the Europeans struggle to get a grip on what has happened in Afghanistan, other countries are proceeding purposefully to try to sort out the problems there and to put the shattered jigsaw in Afghanistan, the pieces of that jigsaw, together again though obviously in a new configuration. And there's been some very important uh, diplomatic and political moves. Firstly, Pakistan, one of the most important countries involved in the Afghan con conflict, 
in a country which many suspect, probably rightly, of providing covert support to the Taliban at various times, has now hosted in uh, Islamabad a very, wa- very large delegation of Afghan leaders who made up the formerly anti-Taliban Northern Alliance. They were all received in um, Islamabad and urged by the Pakistani government to work towards setting up this inclusive government between themselves and the Taliban. And another well-known Afghan official, or former official, the former president, Hamid Kazai, is apparently also with talks, in talks with the Taliban to do the same thing. The Taliban, for their part, have um, um, staged a press conference in Kabul, where they've also spoken at great length and extraordinary detail about the importance of them setting up an inclusive government, how uh, uh, they have an amnesty for all government workers, how people don't need to be afraid, that there's not going to be a a new uh, uh, dark night of fear and terror in Afghanistan, how what they want is stabilisation for the country, how there's going to be an amnesty and how women will be able to continue in their education. We shall see to what extent all of these negotiations succeed. At the moment, as I've said, the auguries are reasonably good, though it's important to say that there was apparently some sort of an incident in the city of Jalalabad, where there was apparently apparently some kind of anti-Taliban protest, which was dispersed by Taliban fighters firing shots into the air. So it's not all peaceful. There has been some uh, incidents in some parts of the country, but perhaps at a time like this, we could, reasonably speaking, expect nothing less. The Afghan leadership, the Taliban leadership, for their part, are said to be on the way to Kabul, and it's very likely that they will meet the Russian and Chinese and presumably also the Pakistani and Iranian ambassadors there. So we are seeing a complex and intricate negotiation underway. Meanwhile, the Russians and the Chinese have now provided detailed readouts of the telephone calls that they had with Secretary, US Secretary of State Blinken. Now, the Russian readout, which I will provide a link to, is actually surprisingly uninformative, but the Chinese have provided much more information and most of it actually comes, um, as is often the case, in a long editorial um, from Global Times. And the Chinese account of Blinken's call to the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi shows that the United States did indeed ask for China's help and by implication also Russia's help to try to stabilise Afghanistan and to ensure that Afghanistan doesn't once again become a base for jihadi terrorist movements that might threaten the United States. I would add that whatever credibility the current administration has in Washington would be finally and irretrievably lost is some sort of terrorist incident were indeed launched against the United States from Afghan territory. I hope and believe that that will not happen, but I suspect that, contrary to some speculations, that is the most urgent priority for the United States government at the moment. They do not want to be put in a position where it seems as if everything that was achieved since the United States went into Afghanistan in 2001, has been brought to naught. And uh, they're asking the Chinese and the Russians for help to do that. But, of course, the Chinese would not be who they are if they were not also secretly gloating over this whole affair. And we learn the following, and I'm quoting now extracts from the Global Times editorial. 
US Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Monday spoke to foreign ministers of countries like China, Russia and India. When speaking with the Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, Blinken said he hopes that China will play an important role in Afghanistan's orderly transfer of power and establishing an inclusive government. To put it bluntly, he came to ask China for help. As of press time, the US has not completed its evacuation of all US and its pers allies' personnel. Earlier on Monday, the US military contacted the Taliban leaders, for the first time we've had that confirmed by the way, asking the latter not to interfere with the US evacuation from A Afghanistan at Kabul airport. So we learned that the United States has asked China and by extension Russia for help to settle Afghanistan and that the US military, are not, not notice the US government, just the US military, are in direct touch with the Taliban to get the Taliban to cooperate with the conduct of the evacuation from Kabul airport. By the way, the same thing happened in 1975 with the US military at that time also being in contact with the North Vietnamese military as it also carried out the evacuation from Saigon. Just saying. Anyway, going back to the Global Times editorial. The US is exhausted in Afghanistan and has to show such a low profile to its former enemy in order to retreat safely. Washington does need other powers, such as China and Russia, to help it clean up the mess in Afghanistan it's, it has left behind and to make its leaving less ugly. China doesn't take advantage of others' perilous state, but hopes that Afghanistan can realise a peaceful transition and end chaos for good. Putting an end to battles as soon as possible is clearly conducive for the vision to bring all Afghan people to better life. In his conversation with Blinken, Wang Yi opposed the US move that it engages in deliberate all-around suppression of China to harm China's interests, but asks China to cooperate with it. It is very necessary at the moment to directly point out that the United States is a strategic rogue. Well, again, Chinese commentary is sometimes colourful in its language, but what the Chinese are saying is entirely to the point. Here we have a US debacle in Afghanistan, and the United States is obliged to do two things. It's obliged to talk through its military to the Taliban to get its evacuation from Kabul underway, unimpeded, and it's got to talk to China and Russia to try to stabilise the situation in Afghanistan. Yet, at the same time as it does that, it has been fighting the Taliban for the last 20 years, and it is trying desperately to contain China and Russia, both of which it refers to autocracies, which the United States is supposed to be engaged in, in some great existential conflict. It wants, in other words, the help of China, Russia, and even the Taliban when it needs it. But of course, at one and the same time, it wants to be rude and uh, um, um, adversarial towards all three when it suits it also. And the Chinese foreign minister, ever so gently, well, perhaps not so gently, presumably pointed, well, apparently pointed out to Blinken the utter inconsistency of this approach. If the United States wants the help of countries like China and Russia when it gets into trouble, then 
it should not seek to take advantage of them in other areas or to create trouble for them in other areas, just as the Chinese and the Russians, in the case of Afghanistan, will not seek to take advantage of the problems that the United States is experiencing there. China and Russia will work towards the establishment of a stable, inclusive government in Afghanistan, one which will lead Afghanistan into integration with the Eurasian institutions led by China and Russia, which ultimately is in the interests now of the United States, given the extent to which the US, US influence in Central Asia has collapsed. But at the same time, they also expect the United States to act with the same sort of moderation and restraint towards them that they still show towards it. Well, of course, there's absolutely no prospect of that. We will see before very long the United States, even as it has to come to China and Russia and beg them for help, seek to pursue confrontation, further confrontation with those countries and consider some of the points that President Biden himself made in that speech that he gave the other day, the one that has caused so much anguish and so much dismay around the world. He actually spoke in that speech about the fact that the true concern for of the United States is to confront its strategic competitors, China and Russia. And these were his words. Um, our true strategic competitors, China and Russia, would love nothing more than the United States to continue to funnel billions of dollars in resources and attention in destabilising Afghanistan indefinitely. So Biden, even as he's Secretary of State, is asking the Chinese and the Russians to help stabilise Afghanistan, is saying that the United States pulled out of the task of stabilising Afghanistan because that would have worked to the advantage of China and Russia. Again, one doesn't need a degree in logic to see the inconsistency and to see also the self-serving quality of American statements and American actions. I would finish this long program by making two further points. Firstly, I want to come back to that comment that Biden made in his, in his speech in which he talked about the terrorist threat having metastasized and about the need to confront various terrorist groups around the world, and the fact that he specifically spoke about al-Nusra in Syria. Al-Nusra, of course, is a genuine force in Syria. It is also the entity in control of Idlib province in northwest Syria, which is the only area that remains under insurgent control in Syria. Do we see there the first indications that perhaps the focus of the United States will shift away from confrontation with the government of Bashar al-Assad? Is there perhaps there the merest hint of a possible drawdown of US forces in Syria also uh, on the uh, basis that the true adversary in Syria is al-Nusra, the organisation that is confronting the Assad government as opposed to the Assad government itself? Well, we shall see. My own view, which I have expressed in previous programmes, is that if this uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan works, then we will indeed start to see an eventual withdrawal from Syria also. But all that remains to be seen. Lastly, and last but not least, consider what the prospects of Afghanistan actually are. 
the U President Biden talked about the United States spending indefinite amounts of time and money to try to stabilise Afghanistan. The reality is that it completely failed in that endeavour because it did not actually speak to the genuine political forces which exist in that country, of which the Taliban, like them or not, is one. How much more realistic the Russians, the Chinese are, when they do, in fact, try to work with the real forces that have traction and power and influence within Afghanistan itself, when they try and persuade these forces in their own interests to try to set up an inclusive and stable government in Afghanistan. Inclusive, I should say, is a word that can be uh, given many different meanings, and we should certainly not mean it in the context of Afghanistan in the same way that we might mean it if we spoke, spoke about inclusiveness in the United States or Britain. Inclusiveness in Afghanistan in the context of the government that there are steps being made to try to create there is means a government that brings together all the strong political forces. The Taliban, the Northern Alliance leaders who are currently or have been speaking to the government of Pakistan, the various communities that exist there. That is practical. That is realistic. The fact that it's practical and realistic doesn't, of course, guarantee success. Nothing ever can be guaranteed success in the area of high policy, especially when we're talking about this kind of complicated reconstruction of a country. But it is far more realistic than to do trying to do what the liberal humanitarians attempted in Afghanistan, which is to recreate this remote, at least to the United States, and complex country in the United States' own image. Upon that, I will end this long and detailed programme. I hope you found it useful and interesting and that it has helped you to understand some of the events that are taking place there. If so, also please come to our other main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. Please also check out Alex's own channel. You will find links under this video. Please also come to our other platforms, BitChute, Bit Odyssey, the new speech, free speech platform, SuperU, and of course, Rumble and Locals, which are now working together. And of course, on Locals, we have a thriving community and one where I'm just about to start uh, making my own uh, individual contributions and where you will shortly find me also doing live streams. I've had to delay doing that because I'm spending so much time trying to keep up with the news from Afghanistan. But hopefully that will now shortly abate. And at the same time, also, if you want to support us, please support us via PayPal, Patreon and Subscribestar. And also don't forget to go to our shop, get yourself the amazing things you will find there. I had a new delivery of amazing hats from Alex. This one has the flag of my own birth country, Greece, which I'm still as deeply or strongly attached to, as you can see. You can see what amazing hats they are, and they're the perfect things that you need on hot, bright, sunny days, be it in Greece or in California or in whatever hot place you might be or whenever the weather is sunny anywhere in your own country. And of course, if you want to uh, uh, subscribe to our channel, well, please do so both on the Duran and on our other platforms uh, and, on, and on YT, of course. And please also remember to tick the like button on this video. Thank you for uh, joining me today and spending the time to listen 
to this long program and I look forward to you joining me again and have a good day.